Hello, everyone. Thank you for filling the room. No applause yet. Maybe at the end, if you like it, right? This is too premature, but thank you for the vote of confidence. So uh, I'm the founder of a company called Inverse Path, and I'm going to talk to you about our, the project that we did this year, which is called the USB Armory, which is this very little thing over here. So just to give you a little bit of background about uh, what we do, we try every two years or so uh, to come up with some very exotic and interesting research. We were one of the first ones in 2007 to do car hacking uh, by sending fake messages to navigation systems. Two years after that, we did some uh, tempest attacks where we could just sniff keystrokes either using laser pointers against laptop chassis or uh, from the power outlet for wired computers. Uh, in 2011, we uh, published uh, research about chip and pin, uh, which shows how you can uh, basically intercept uh, the pin in credit card transactions all the time with a skimmer. And two years ago, we did a talk about packet in packet for Ethernet connection. So we specialize in the fact that we do not only software, but also a lot of hardware uh, uh, in terms of security in our daily work and also research. And this year, we decided to build something for a change rather than, you know, breaking things. Because sometimes to build something and then have it in your hands and you made it, it's, it's something nice. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about our journey into making this open hardware device, which is the USB armory. Um, so the USB Armory, it's an open source project which uh, basically uh, puts a full-blown computer in a very tiny form factor. And the idea came out because we wanted something that could allow us to have uh, open source encryption in our pocket. But uh, there was nothing that would provide this kind of functionality at the time. Uh, uh, you can, of course, buy military-grade encryption, USB drives, all kind of things where you have no idea of what goes on. And most of the times, we, we also did a lot of audits on these devices, uh, security is not great. So we wanted something where you are actually in control uh, of what's happening. So the first idea was to have uh, not only uh, cryptographic mass storage, but some kind of enhanced mass storage with security features such as I copy a file, maybe it gets scanned for malware, maybe it gets encrypted with OpenPGP or whatever you like, and then it gets stored on a microSD. So this was the first concept, to have something where uh, my files would be encrypted with a process that you are in control and that it's transparent for you. And then the idea of building such a device slowly, you know, uh, you know, developed and we thought, but hey, why emulating mass storage? We could just have a device which just shows up as a TCP IP server and then we could have a browser accessing uh, this device and maybe we could push some more convenient functionality for maybe sharing files or doing uh, more advanced stuff. Um, and from there we thought, but hey, if we can have custom code and we can have a device which is powerful enough, we could have all kind, this, uh, all kind of advanced features such as if I put a fail-safe word, then everything on the device gets wiped. Or if I put a decoy password, uh, you show picture of kittens to your immigration guard rather than your porn. Wouldn't that be great? that you could do something like that. So, you know, features that, of course, are not uh, available uh, anywhere or were not at the time. And then if we put, you know, a full TCP IP stack on this device, we could also use it as an SSH proxy. We could have our SSH keys on the device. You can SSH to the device itself and then SSH out from the device to your servers. So that if you go to a kiosk or somebody else's computer, uh, you don't have to share uh, your secrets. You can just use this device as something which is really, uh, you know, compact. You can keep it in your pocket and you can use it uh, for these kind of features. Uh, of course, then it could also be a password manager. You know, you can put your passwords on it. You can have either a browser extensions or, you know, you cut and paste in your clipboard. You can have your password stored there and so on and so on. Um, it could be, of course, an authentication token for not for a single protocol, but for any protocol that you like if you can put uh, custom code on it. Uh, and also, a very interesting feature which, uh, idea which uh, came out by pushing more and more power into this device was that since this device kind of becomes an active device and not a merely a passive drive, it could also authenticate the host. So it can decide to refuse to perform certain actions if it's plugged in, in, a, in a laptop, let's say, which is not yours. You can actively fingerprint uh, the device that it's connected to and then take decisions upon uh, what you consider to be security violations. And so there was nothing that would, no hardware that would fit uh, uh, 
you know, that would provide functionality that could enable these features. And for these reasons, we thought that it would be an excellent idea to have an open source hardware that just implements a, you know, standard computer on such a small uh, form factor. So very early on, we set a few design goals to meet this, uh, uh, to, to, to provide a platform for the applications that we wanted. It must be compact and it must be USB power, of course. We don't want any external power to be fed into the device. It must have a fast CPU and a generous amount of RAM, so it must be a little bit of future proof. Uh, it must support secure boot because otherwise, you know, uh, anybody can run whatever code on it. You can have evil made attacks, even if it's something that you can carry in your pocket, which somehow mitigates the evil made attack. But still, you know, secure boot was something that we thought was essential on this kind of device. And it needs to provide standard connectivity over USB. It doesn't need to be too clunky. It needs to be something that you plug it in and it, and it works. Uh, and it needs to have a familiar developing and execution environment. This is very important. Uh, we work a lot on embedded systems where, where every time the development environment is completely customized to that specific, uh, let's say, microcontroller. And it's always, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a learning curve, there's, there's a lot of annoyance in getting all the tools working. We wanted something, uh, we want to leverage on the fact that we needed a powerful device to, to have something which was easy, super easy and convenient to use. And of course, it must be uh, as open as, as, as we could make it, so completely open hardware. So, when developing hardware such as this device, uh, I would say that half of the work is selecting the proper component. And of course, for doing something like this in such a small form factor, you need to use a system on a chip. Uh, our choice went to the Freescale IMX53. And this uh, was chosen for several reasons. Uh, it's a, first of all, it's a pretty powerful system on a chip. It's a ARM Cortex-A8 that can be clocked between 800 megahertz and 1.2 gigahertz. Almost all data sheet and manuals are open. There's no NDA required, especially for secure boot, which is important. The data sheets are okay. They're not great, but I wouldn't say that any data sheet from any vendor, it's great, uh, but they're far better than other vendors. And we have ARM trust and support, secure boot, and there's also secure storage and secure RAM on, on the system on the chip. There was a detailed power consumption guide available, which for, for us was really important because the power budget on a USB port is limited, so we wanted to make sure that, of course, uh, the USB port doesn't shut down because you're consuming, uh, to, you're draining too much current. Uh, and there's excellent native support for this chip. Android, Debian, Ubuntu, FreeBSD, they all support in uh, uh, this kind of uh, system on a chip. So this was very promising. And also there's good stock and production guarantee. You don't want to uh, commit to a design uh, and then, you know, see after you've done your work and your PCB layout that Freescale tells you, sorry, this part is out of stock anymore. Uh, is out of stock because that would suck so much. So this part is supported, I think, until 2020 or something like that. So these were the reasons for getting this system on a chip, which has way more features than what we needed uh, to use. It has a, you know, Canvas connection, has two GPUs, one for 2D, one for 3D, uh, video processing unit and so on. But we only uh, make it so that we power up the things that we require in order to uh, achieve the goals for, for the board. Everything else is just uh, not powered up on, on, on this design. And also, this system on a chip provides a good trust and support, uh, which we audited before uh, taking on this project. And uh, what trust and provides you, uh, it's something that it's pretty much on every ARM phone. It is used, uh, for instance, on the Nexus 5 from Google. It's used for uh, the key, key store uh, and DRM uh, functionality. So trust on provides you an additional domain separation in the CPU context. So you can have what is called the non-secure world, where your normal uh, Linux user mode and privileged kernel mode runs. And then you have another uh, execution context, which runs in parallel with your normal OS, where you can lock down and put specific functionality that can also be assigned to specific device uh, drivers and specific devices. So with trust on, you can take ownership of a specific hardware subcomponent and assign it only to the secure domain so that the non-secure domain cannot ever uh, see it. Uh, and I'm gonna show you an example of, of, of the way this functionality um, can be used. So this was a feature which we wanted to explore. Uh, Arm Trustson is widely used, but there's uh, little examples and little uh, playgrounds so that people can develop on it because vendors tend to be very secretive about what they do in trust. And so we thought this was a good chance to leverage on, on this functionality. 
Um, and on this specific system on a chip, we trust on you can assign things like the microSD or the Ethernet or the USB controller or GPIOs only to the secure domain if you want to. And the non-secure domain doesn't even know of the existence of those hardware subcomponents. So think of it as a kind of a virtualization feature that also provides hardware firewalling. But, uh, and this is part of the ARM security extensions. Um, so, uh, we did uh, a crowdfunded project which was successful. We shipped on time, which always happens, right, when you kickstart or crowdfund something, right? So we were right on time, uh, and um, it's completely open source. It's licensed under the CERN Open Hardware uh, License. Um, and the specifications are, of course, we have our uh, IMX53 chip. It's USB host power. It's very, very, very tiny. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a micro SD card slot in the back which provides, uh, it's like the disk for the device. There are no other flashable uh, components on the device. So all the code, almost all the code comes from the micro SD card. We have a five pin breakout header with GPIOs and serial port. And there's a LED on it which we leverage for trust and support. Because with trust on, you can assign the LED only to the secure domain so that you can make it so that if the LED is on, you know by design that the secure domain is working at the time. So if you're prompting for a password, for instance, and you see that the LED is on, you know that the normal non-secure domain cannot uh, fish that password because it cannot ever turn on the LED. So this is the reason why we put the LED also for a secure mode detection. And we have excellent native support now, Debian, Ubuntu, Arch Linux, Kali Linux, they all run natively on the device with no modification required uh, whatsoever. And it's also a very good platform for emulating arbitrary USB device. So we emulate Ethernet as, a, as our standard means of communication, but you can also emulate mass storage, you can emulate keyboards, you can fuzz USB, USB from it, you can do a lot of things. In fact, we use this, uh, with, with this platform for many projects where we had to fuzz USB at a very, very low level. And you can do it in a way which is uh, a lot faster than using other microcontroller-based uh, solutions. And it's open hardware and open software. Now, the interesting thing, of course, this is a USB device, so it's primarily meant to be used, attached to your laptop, to your host, or, or whatever, but it can also have host mode. So we found later on that despite uh, the fact that we are driving the USB ID pin to the ground, which usually forces the uh, on-the-go controller to be in one specific mode, we found that the USB controller on this system on a chip is very forgiving, and it allows you to override a lot of settings. So uh, despite uh, the actual uh, electrical layout not being in favor of this option, we can actually turn the device into host mode, uh, meaning that we can completely invert uh, the role of the USB device. So by just uh, bridging uh, a female to female connector and feeding power back in, you can attach a USB hub. So that's a USB powered hub which is then feeding uh, um, power back to the USB armory and we have a keyboard mouse, a USB display, that's a MIMO USB touchscreen, and we also have a Wi-Fi uh, dongle right there. So you can also use it a completely standalone way, and for this reason we built a adapter, so this is the host adapter, where you can just plug it in, if you configure the device to be in host mode, then you can attach, I don't know, this is a, a Wi-Fi dongle, you feed power back in, and then you have an access point where, you know, you can put Tor on it, uh, open VPN uh, and, and whatever you like. So this was a nice feature that we only realized after the design was done and after the first batch was ordered. And luckily, uh, it could be done and it expanded the actual applications uh, for the device. And the host adapter, since there's no data lines going from this to the two ports, also acts as a nice, uh, you know, safe charging uh, little uh, little uh, gadget where you can safely charge two devices uh, making sure that no data can come from here to there. So, you know, it was a little nice uh, tiny gadget to, to do for this device. Um, so, let's talk about the development of this device. So, this device has uh, two BGA chips. So, BGA means ball grid array, which means that this is the system on a chip. You have this very nice array of little tiny balls that are then soldered on the PCB. And this makes development a lot more difficult because it's not really easy to prototype this on your own. It's not something that you can use in solder and desolder and so on. So, when developing this device, we thought, let's try to play it smart. Uh, let's make a breakout board 
where we can actually put our system on a chip on it, and then we can power it up, we can debug everything that we need, and then uh, we make the final PCB. So we make a breakout board, uh, which basically was breaking out all of the connections that we needed to, uh, to break out on a bigger board, which was this one over here. So here we have a socket. This is a fairly expensive socket, which allows you to clamp the system on a chip without having to solder it on on the socket, and also the socket itself, so you can screw it on the PCB and no soldering is required. So even if you mess it up, you just take another system on a chip, you put it you know, back and in and out very, very easily, and then we've broken out all of the connection to this pin. And we've done uh, similar designs in the past to uh, either access or reverse engineer some certain, let's say, uh, flash, BGA flash that we needed to access after having this solder from a PCB. But the problem here, so you can see our mascot is Darth Vader here. And this was myself, this was my colleague Andre Rosano, and this was like Darth Vader saying to the Admiral, you fail me for the last time. Because what, we, what, what my colleague tried to do, and it was actually very good at it, was getting really good. Uh, he tried to, uh, to solder and to assemble all the power regulator uh, uh, equipment that was required to, to power up the system on a chip. But the problem is that the tolerances of the distances between the inductors and, 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 and the power controller were so high that if you try to do this on, on a breadboard like this, or uh, it, it will never work. There are seven uh, power rails that need to power up the system on a chip, and you can only get the, the best attempt was six rails stable, and the seventh was not stable at all. So, you know, after a few tries, this was not going anywhere. So we thought then we have to make a PCB with all the power components, but if we do that, we might also put the sock on the PCB, and if we do that, we might as well put also the RAM, and then we might as well do the first prototype alpha version complete. So at the end, this very nice uh, breakout uh, board was like a superstar destroyer, something which is expensive, it's big, but it's completely useless and crashes down very heavily and very loud. So it was completely uh, useless, but it makes a nice prop in our office. So. Um, the second challenge into, uh, into building this device is that um, since you want it to be open hardware, open hardware technically it could, but it doesn't really mean that you're just publishing the, the design files. It also means that you need to provide them in a way which is easy for you not only to read them but also to modify them if you really want to. So, uh, publishing, uh, you know, design files that require a commercial tool that costs 20,000 euro doesn't really fit my definition of open hardware. So we use KiCad for that, uh, which is an open source um, design tool, um, which is this one here. And the problem uh, by using this tool is that at the time, but even today I think it would be a challenge, there's no length trace matching uh, functionality. So I'm going to explain the problem right there. So this is the RAM module of the board, and this here is the system on a chip. So all the connections that goes from the RAM module to the system on a chip, they all need to be exactly of the same length. Um, and the problem is that if your tool doesn't help you in manually do that, you basically have to, the, to do this all by hand. So all of these traces here are exactly of the same length. And not only that's a challenge uh, because of the size of the board, but the, the, the biggest issue there is that usually when you go from the system on a chip to the RAM, you can also route your traces around the memory module. You have some kind of freedom. But since this is a very compact device and we want it to be as wide as narrow as possible, which means being as wide as the system on a chip was, uh, we really can only go straight from the system on a chip to the RAM module. And you would think that the, the way the, the pads on the system on a chip and the pads on the RAM are laid out so that it makes it easy and straightforward to do that, that's absolutely not the case. So this was a huge pain to do all of this manually, where with a professional tool, this would have been much, much easier. Uh, however, the 3D uh, display functionality of KiCad are great, are completely useless because, you know, they didn't, don't really give you anything useful, but, you know, we could actually see the board in 3D very effectively uh, before manufacturing, which I think it was nice. Uh, we couldn't change the color now of the board, so we made the board black because we think everything is cooler in black, but, you know, we could only see it in green there. So it wasn't even useful for making screenshots for publishing, you know. 
Um, this was the first alpha board that we made. Uh, it had a JTAG uh, connection uh, broken out. Um, and the reason for that is that, of course, when you make the very first prototype, uh, you don't know if it's going to work. A lot of things can go wrong. And at least if you can power up the system on a chip, you will get JTAG, and that will allow you to uh, understand which connections are not working and, and, and so on. Um, of course, if the system on chip doesn't power up, this was uh, for us the biggest risk, then it gets really difficult to debug what's going on. Uh, so we, we had a lot of test pads on the board, but not so many also because at the first attempt we wanted to emulate the actual form factor of the board. So uh, this board was laid out so that the actual form factor of the board was uh, put here, and if you would cut these two uh, sections, then the board would still function and would still be a meaningful representation of, 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 of the final unit. So we wanted to minimize the number of batches that we would do because also doing a PCB with these kind of specifications, it gets uh, really expensive really fast if you, uh, if, you, if you go through a lot of iterations. Uh, so this is the board attached uh, to uh, my laptop with a JTA controller, but luckily, and this, I hope this is an inspiration for doing open hardware, uh, the first prototype worked perfectly at the very first attempt. So we weren't, we were a lot paranoid and a lot worried about many things that could have gone wrong. Things actually are usually much better than what it looks. And of, you know, I would say that not all, but most of the very partner recommendations that you see on the various data sheets and components, you know, they're very, very conservative. So. Uh, this was kind of a crazy design, so we were not conservative at all in the, in the way we did things, but, you know, uh, uh, it worked nonetheless. And I think it's, you know, despite me bashing KiCad for not doing length trace matching, I think it's pretty amazing that with only open source tools we can do something like this today, which is as powerful as a Pentium 2, and, but this is a complete uh, device on its own, completely standalone uh, computer. I think, however, Dark Vader kind of prefers the Pentium 2 because it's bigger and, and black and, and very nice. But anyway, so this was the uh, uh, batches that we made, so the, the development versions that we made. So we had the alpha version here, very first version. We only made two of these, by the way, which is a very bad idea. Why would you make two? You know, it's, it was very, very risky. Uh, it could have been that both of them would not work just because something in the assembly was, was wrong. So uh, make more and use the whole PCB panel that you have. We had a whole PCB panel. We just asked for two. We didn't use it all. So that was really stupid on our side. Then when we did the beta run, we learned our lesson, and we actually used the entire panel for doing different versions. Uh, so we did with one tooling, so tooling is um, when you make a PCB, there will be some costs associated to the specific design that you're doing. And if you use one panel, you can fit different versions in it and have pretty much the same cost for tooling. So we did a batch of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different beta versions. And what we tried to do with these betas uh, was to uh, lower the number of components, be less and less conservative about the way we would, we would power up the device, and also remove some layers. So going from eight layers to six layers to see if we could reduce the cost of the board as much as we can. And we actually managed to find a design which worked just fine, which was had even less components than the current board, but the current consumption was a little high. So we just went for the middle ground and we managed to use six layers instead of eight layers. So from this um, uh, from the batch of betas, uh, we picked what eventually became the Mark I, which is the first production unit. And also, uh, in the alpha, we did not have the LED, and then we decided to include it in, in the beta version. So lessons learned during development. We had some inductors in the alpha and beta version, which after basically three weeks of just gently putting the board on the table and taking it off, they would just fall off they would just completely fall apart because the inductors were really fragile. So it was very good that we caught that before making 2,000 of these. Trust me on that. So, um, so we replaced them with some other inductors from TDK, which are more efficient, cheaper, and they have a much better shape, which looks like a Ballastar Galactica notepad. So when you make hardware, you get excited about these things. You get excited about the, this tiny inductor. You're like, oh, I found a nice components, you know. So it does something to your mind making hardware, trust me. Uh, the second problem was that um, so the USB pads, they need to be gold-plated because otherwise you use them 50 times and they will be gone. So uh, we asked the manufacturer to gold-plate our, our USB pads. 
And this is, was an interesting uh, thing. What happened there when we got our beta version, uh, we would plug it in, and then the boot up would be delayed by five seconds, precisely five seconds every time. So when that happens, what are you going to do? You're going to look into the data sheet of the system on a chip and the power regulator, and you're going to search in the PDF for the words five seconds, because that's a very precise time, uh, which something must enforce that. Um, and it turned out that the, the power regulator has a five second delay if it detects under voltage when you plug in the device. And so we're wondering, why is this happening? This wasn't happening with the alpha version, which wasn't, however, gold plated. And so what it turned out is that the manufacturer for uh, laying out the, the gold plating, uh, it added uh, these traces that go outwards from the paths to the edge of the board. And what would happen is that when they cut the board, you would get four little, very tiny connective dots here on the edge of the board. So if you plug the board in the USB connector, the USB plug would make contact on those little four pads, then it would lose contact for the length that goes from the little edge to the pad itself, and then it would make contact again. And that was creating the under voltage. And this was, these traces were not in our Gerber files, were not in our design. So it took, you know, two days to understand what was going on. Then at some point we put tape on it, we plug it in, and the problem was gone. So, so in the final version, the gold plating is laid out oh, using pads, these four pads, which is safe. So this was very interesting problem, uh, not uh, caused by our design, but you know, caused by manufacturing. And uh, you know, I, it's something that I mentioned because I think it's 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 it was interesting. So this is the final uh, design. We have the system on a chip. We have the RAM. We have the pin header here. We have the LED. This is a power regulator component. Everything else is passive. These are the crystals. And this is the micro SD card, uh, which basically it's what it's booted uh, as soon as you power up um, the uh, device. We now also have trust and support in a OS, which you might not know of. It's, it's, it's not quite famous, but it's called Gnode. So with Gnode OS, um, now, uh, you have a playground where you can boot Gino, which is a microkernel based OS, into the secure domain and then place Linux in the non secure domain. So, this gives you something uh, that you can play with uh, and requires a minimally patched Linux kernel to actually uh, be used. So, uh, this is um, uh, uh, not only we pick Trust and for System on a chip, but we also managed to get uh, support from. Uh, a fairly big open source project for this uh, specific hardware. And also, you can also put your own code, by the way, in Trust and it's pretty easily. So we have a proof of concept where we just patch U-boot and we basically put minimal code into the secure domain that claims ownership of the LED. So uh, with just a few lines of assembly, we take ownership of GPIO number four, we take ownership of the IO MOOCs, which is the one that can be used to change the role of the GPIO. We also want to take ownership of that. And we take ownership of the internal RAM of the system on a chip. Uh, and then we have what is called a secure monitor handler, which basically, when it's invoked, it just toggles the LED. It switches the direction of the GPIO um, output. And the way you would use this from Linux in kernel space you execute the SMC instruction and you put a specific argument which uh, in this case we put CAFE. So if you put CAFE in R0 and then you issue the SMC call, the execution context of the system on a chip will just switch to the secure domain. The secure domain will have time to inspect the memory, the register and take a decision and in this case will toggle the LED on or off and then it will relinquish back control to the non-secure domain. If you try to turn on and off the LED from the non-secure domain directly, it will not work. Linux will not even know of the existence of the secure domain. And this is uh, a first example on the way you can leverage on this functionality. Uh, because then from the secure domain, you take ownership of the LED, you know that the LED is on, you know that the secure domain is doing stuff, you, know, you can ask for a password, you can do some encryption functionality, and so on. And so on. You can basically use it as a soft runtime smart card, which you provision at put, and which you know is going to be separated from the other um, execution context. Now, we also have secure boot on this device, and we just published 
yesterday instruction on how to enable secure boot on the device. So secure boot in the Freescale IMAX 53 parlance is, is, is called the high assurance boot. And what it does, it does boot image verification. So you can have four public keys which are permanently, so the hash of these keys is permanently fused on the device. So unlike the secure boot that we define on a PC, so on a PC you can always at some point reset the computer, right? You can decide to boot other code. On these devices, and uh, rightly so, this is a feature, once you do this operation, it's permanent and irreversible. So you fuse the keys on the SOC, and from that moment on, the device will refuse to boot anything that is not signed uh, with these keys. Um, you can also revoke up to three keys out of four, which means that you can also have some interesting patterns here if you want to. You can have a three valid keys and you can have the fourth key, which is complete garbage, completely random hash. And so your code running in user space uh, in, 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 the, in your, in your you know, execution context can decide to brick the device if you want to. Uh, if the device is not secure booted, you can decide to activate secure boot with random keys or if it's a secure booted, you can leave your last slot and then you can revoke the first three keys. So when I mentioned that the device can authenticate the host, it's fairly easy to have code that if you type the wrong password for a certain number of times, or if you plug this for multiple times on a laptop which is, on, which is not yours, it can just decide to render the device completely unusable, which I think it's, you know, it's a pretty interesting feature. So it kind of becomes like a tamper-proof uh, operation by leveraging on the secure boot. Uh, functionality. So the fuses work in a way you have these this bits in the system on a chip uh, which you can, you can permanently fuse to, to one and you can also when you want them to be zero you can also lock them so that not, nobody else can then uh, put them to one again. So you have a table hash for the public keys and you have bits that uh, provides you, uh, free bits that provides you uh, the revo revocation functionality. Uh, and this is an example of a key being fused from U-boot, but you can also do it from, uh, from a running OS uh, permanently into the device. And once you do that, only, well, so this is an example, so in this case we're fusing key A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, F, and so on. And once you do that, so uh, if you have a signed U-boot bootloader, you will get uh, secure boot enable and no uh, high assurance boot events found and then your Linux uh, kernel will be booted correctly. Uh, otherwise, if you get a failure, you get events invalid, so HIV failure, HIV invalid signature and, and the device will not uh, work. Uh, the secure boot functionality and also the trust fund functionality, uh, the debug uh, controllers on the system on a chip are also aware of this functionality. So it's not that with JTAG uh, you can full trust on and you can go and debug the secure domain easily and extract secrets from there uh, or you can bypass uh, secure boot. Uh, you can either decide to disable JTAG for instance or you can make it so that JTAG only works when the non-secure execution context is on. So uh, we made sure that uh, as far as we can tell there are no ways to bypass um, this kind of uh, functionality. Now, we provided the hardware, we published the hardware. Uh, I have here, right now, this is a USB armory, which I'm connected to, which is connected to my laptop. So now, here I'm on Windows because I always present from Windows because using a projector from Linux is the hardest things in the world, apparently. It's the most complex IT problem right now in the industry, so I always use Windows. But, it, but it's very nice that I have my USB armory attached and from Windows I can just SSH into a more uh, relax in a familiar environment for me, which is Linux. So it provides a safe haven, which I can carry in my pocket and plug in my Windows. So we see we have half a gig of RAM available. This is just Arch Linux, by the way, uh, running a kernel, which is probably even more modern than the one I have on my own laptop, which is 4.2.0. Uh, and it's just happily running, very responsive. You know, it, it basically, uh, it, it's probably, this thing is probably faster than your backup NAS little appliance NAS server that you have at home. Um, and so we develop an application which is called Interlock to implement some of the concepts that we've been discussing and, and to provide use cases for this device. So Interlock is an open source file encryption front end 
which has been developed for the USB armory, but its usage, of course, it's not limited to the USB armory. You can use it on a Raspberry Pi, on whatever, on your server, on whatever other device that you want. And what it does, it provides a web accessible fronted to an encrypted partition, partition encrypted with the Linux unified uh, key system. Uh, and we can also take advantage of disposable passwords. So um, I'll show you in a second a demo of that. So you can have more than one password associated to the decryption or encryption of your partition. And you can dis also decide uh, to delete some of them if you, if you want to, uh, which I think is a pretty, pretty interesting um, option. So at login, we can decide to dispose of the password that we're typing. So if you're concerned that someone is intercepting the keystrokes of the host machine that you're connected to, that password, as soon as it's used, it would not be useful to decrypt the full contents of the disk if you lose the device, which I think is a very, uh, very nice feature. And in developing this application, we had a, also a few design goals. We wanted a clear separation between the presentation layer and the server layer to ease integration and auditability of this program. So we ended up with a Go server application where all of the uh, front end is handled purely on the client side with, with, with JavaScript. Uh, and that's the untrusted part, so to speak. We support Lux encrypted partitions. And then once you open up the files, we also support OpenPGP uh, for asymmetric cipher. We support uh, AES uh, 256 um, bits for symmetric ciphers. And we also support TOTP tokens, so the Google Authenticator tokens that you can uh, configure for uh, Google Mail or GitHub or Stripe or whatever other application. You can also have those tokens not only on your phone, but also imported here. And now we also support messaging. So from this uh, front end, we can also do text secure and signal uh, interoperation. So not only we can uh, chat with other uh, text secure and signal client, but we can also share files. Um, and uh, so the application, it works in this uh, manner. You have the client browser, the API is all JSON requests, and as soon as you log in, uh, the credentials are being used to do the looks open command, which opens the micro SD partition and, and so on, and then you can access um, the file. So you can encrypt the files, you can read them, and all of the encryption and decryption, it all happens on the USB armor itself. It doesn't happen on the client. And the API of this, the, of, this, um, of this client is made so that you can never extract private keys from it. So you can do cryptographic operation, you can download the public keys, but never the private keys. So now I'm gonna show you the way interlock works. So I'm gonna log out first, so you see. So now I have my USB armory here, which is here. And this is the login prompt. So you can see that I can also dispose the password after use if I want to. The username, so to speak, is the volume name. And the password is one of the passwords that you decide to configure for decrypting the volume. As soon as I log in, the encrypted partition gets unlocked and we get um, this kind of file manager display for our files. Now, I have files here. I can decide to view the files if I want. This is a text file over there. I can also decide to encrypt them with either OpenPGP or AES. And here I'm using one of the keys that I have here. I can encrypt the file, and then the file is encrypted. And then I can also download the file if I want to. So now the file gets downloaded. To copy a file on it, I'll show you how complicated it is. You just get a file, and you drag and drop it, and it gets uploaded to the USB armory. And all of the things that you see here lives on the encrypted uh, partition. Uh, you can have multiple selection. You can cut and paste. You can decide to compress a file if you want. You can compress a directory. So this is basically kind of like Google Drive. You can download a directory uh, and so on. And all of the keys which are here, so you can view uh, the private keys, the public keys if you want. So this is a OpenPGP public key. But you can never view or download the uh, private keys. And the API prevents that. It's not just a cosmetic thing that happens in the client side, of course. Um, and also, we have text secure functionality. So let's try that. So now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send a text secure signal message to my armory from my mobile phone. So 
So I just sent that. We should see a notification popping up. So we see receive message. And if I go into contacts, a new contact has been created. I can rename the contact with a name, of course. So this is me. And here is the chat. So I can say, so the message was hello from 44con. Hello back. And I just got a message now from my USB armory. Now I can also share files. So I can send a picture from my phone. Let's, let's find a good one. Okay. Let's see if the demo gods are kind to us today. I'm tethering through Samuel's mobile phone, so the, the connection is not super fast. So while we wait for the message, so the functionality of sending attachments, it's really important for one reason. Because not only, of course, we can share files between a mobile phone or a USB armory or interlock instance, I would say, but we can also share files between interlock instances. So if I want to share a file from the encrypted storage on my USB armory, I can just do so from the device itself, and it does end-to-end -end encryption from my device to some other interlock installation. I don't have to go through OpenPGP if I want to avoid that. I don't have to go through SMTP. So I just need a valid test secure signal register client to access uh, this functionality, uh, which makes it easy with less steps. And, and you can also leverage on the existing functionality that you have in interlock. So you can also decide to encrypt a file before sending it out. Um, let's see. If I got the attachment, no. But we do, I think we do have demo gods. I didn't sacrifice enough virgins this morning to the demo gods. Let's see. Okay, there we got the attachment over there. So in the chat, we get a notification that an attachment was received. Then I can go into the attachment section. The attachments are uh, organized per contact. So I got one attachment. I know that it's an image file, so I can rename it. If you send and receive messages from the mobile client, the mobile client doesn't give you the file name. If you share files between interlock instances, the file name will be uh, placed into some metadata in the message, so you will receive the file with the proper file name. So the reason why I didn't get the file name here is because it's a limitation of the mobile client on Android and on iPhone, not on the uh, not a limitation of interlock. So I can just rename and I can just download and guess this is going to be a nice picture of my cat. So I just successfully shared uh, a, a file from my mobile phone uh, to interlock. Now there's an interesting thing here. Uh, actually we're going to keep the picture there for a while so that maybe you will enjoy it. I know there's a one member in the audience which loves cats here. Um, so um, if you use a mobile client for doing text secure and signal functionality, there are some limitations. All the images will be recompressed, and there's a limitation in the size of the files that you can share. But by using uh, the infrastructure directly, as we do from interlock, uh, there are no limitations and there's no recompression or manipulation of the files. So we share files of 20 megabytes from one USB armory to the other and it just works uh, just fine. So uh, we think it's a very, very, very convenient functionality and it's a nice way to leverage on the existing context that we have here. So all of the keys from TechSecure are all on the cryptographic partition and they cannot be extracted in the same manner that you cannot extract the private open PGP keys and, and, and so on. So we're trying to build more and more into this application so that it's a, an encryption front end which is easy to use, is somehow intuitive to use uh, regarding the file operation and it kind of takes away 
all of the clunkiness now that you have when you want to encrypt a file with GPG and share it and so on. Uh, the Open PGP implementation that we have here is very basic. It uses all defaults that we think are safe and it's as easy as just, you know, encrypt you know, select the cipher and, and, and so on. You can, of course, generate a key on the device or you can decide to import existing key in the device. So uh, we, we try to make it uh, easy to use. We have, of course, an audit log over here. So we see that everything that we have done was, was, being, uh, uh, was being logged. We can, of course, log out of the application. We can add or remove passwords from it. And we can also power off the device. So if I power off, it would just shut down my USB armory, which now is off, and this where, was where everything was um, executed. Uh, the entire application is not only it's open source and written in Go, but uh, it also has a very minimal amount of dependencies. We use standard Go libraries for all the encryption with the exception of the text secure signal functionality, which is optional. You can decide to include it at compile time or not. And we have, I think we have about 3,000 lines of code. So the code is very compact, very auditable. Uh, so, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, let's say, fork to the GPG binary or stuff like that. Uh, it tries to be something which is uh, comprehensible. And this to, you know, promote the fact that we made this device specifically to is its auditability and to give something that people can rely and trust on for doing this kind of uh, operations. So, um, that was the end of my talk. I, I thank you very much for your attention. And now I think we have time for questions, if you have any.